Michelle, thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk today about submarine navigation. Not so much the modern part of submarine navigation, what actually happens today, but very much of the unchanging principles that govern how you become a submariner and navigate submarines. Because submarines fascinate, they always have. And since their inception at the start of the 20th century, over time and hardened by warfare, they've made the transition from small submersible craft of limited range to, today, to today's nuclear powered attack or strategic missile firing submarines. Now in the beginning, the Royal Navy in common with other navies saw submarines as no fit place for an officer and a gentleman, such that for decades afterwards, the submarine service was known always as the trade. But the First World War saw them come into their own in the highly successful U-boat campaign against British and Allied shipping, which very nearly in 1917 brought this country to sue for peace with Germany. It didn't happen, but it was close. There were very successful British submarine campaigns in the Baltic and in the Sea of Marmara in support of uh, the Gallipoli campaign and elsewhere. So the submarine had truly arrived as a weapon of war. And the Second World War saw something very similar for the submarines on each side were essentially very much the same as in the Great War. Small torpedo firing submarines fitted with a deck gun to deal with smaller targets, now with slightly increased speed, better torpedoes, greater endurance, greater diving depth, but essentially the same. These were diesel powered submersibles spending the bulk of any patrol on the surface and switching to massive batteries for underwater propulsion. There were very heavy shipping losses from the U-boat campaign in the Battle of the Atlantic by British submarines in the Mediterranean and the most successful submarine campaign ever in the Pacific, where the United, submarine, United States Submarine Force effectively wiped out the Japanese mercantile fleet in an operation called Operation Starvation using torpedoes, guns and mines. It was a very successful campaign, but there were very heavy losses too. The, the German U-boat arm lost 80% of all its submarines and all its people in the course of the war. So a major part of the fascination with submarines, and I, I still find this fascinating, is their ability to move in three dimensions unseen. These are, after all, the original stealth fighters. So how do they navigate? Well, in the case of the earliest submarines, the answer was with some difficulty or indeed by guess or by God, as it was known. They had charts, of course, a simple mechanical log, a magnetic compass, a clock, a very basic uh, periscope, and a sextant. And that was the total navigational fit. On the surface, visual bearings and astro-navigation were used. Dive, na dive navigation was conducted by dead reckoning, which is straightforward. If you go east at three knots, for four hours, you'll be 12 miles further east. And by estimated position, which is dead reckoning with uh, the influences of um, external influences applied, tide and, and a tidal stream. And until the arrival of a serviceable echo sander, submarines might simply bottom onto the seabed gently and note the depth. But let's look at the uh, uh, generation of Royal Navy submarines, which saw service from the 1950s through to 1991 and the Gulf War. These were porpoise class submarines uh, of eight and 13 of the Oberon class. Now, essentially, these were a development of the highly successful German Type 21 U-boats of 1944 and 45. And you'll see, you'll see uh, uh, HMS Orpheus here in this first slide. Um, these had a crew of 67. They had a large torpedo load. They carried sufficient diesel fuel for their two generators to take them from the UK to the far side of the Indian Ocean. They were excellent and remarkably quiet and effective submarines. Now the maximum speed surfaced would be, if the hull was nice and clean, 13 knots. Dive could give you 16 to 17 knots, but that required massive discharge rate from the huge main batteries. At lower speeds, say three or four knots, dived endurance on batteries was literally for days. The batteries themselves um, 
because of a diesel electric propulsion, always propel the main motors. The batteries are charged by the diesel generators. And by varying the voltage across the armatures of the main motors, you could vary the speed range, the gears effectively, uh, and thus the speed of the submarine. But at absolutely maximum speed, you were putting 880 volts across each motor armature at a discharge rate of up to 15,000 amps. This is very serious heavy electrics. Now the snorkel or the snort allows you to, to charge the main batteries at periscope depth, running this to supercharged V16 diesel sphere, uh, a 14 inch induction system. But this was a very successful design, uh, which was sold to the Canadian, the Australian, the Brazilian and the Chilean navies. So that in the 60s and 70s in any UK submarine, uh, a fair number of the officer strength would be Australian or Canadian, or more rarely Chilean or Brazilian. A few myths first about submarines. Firstly, and for this we blame Hollywood, um, it's not on Christian name terms. Um, there's not a lot of rum drunk. Um, you don't have to clear your ears when you blow main ballast tanks. And above all, we do not wear caps in submarines, let alone turn them back to front when looking through the periscope. I blame Hollywood for all these. Now, some basics about submarine navigation and how they move. Submarines move and navigate within a fixed or moving space of water allocated by a central naval authority. For most people in the Eastern Atlantic, this is somewhere near London. There's a similar setup in the, uh, the Western Atlantic or in the Mediterranean with separate authorities. You may be allocated a geographic exercise area for a specified period of time and or a moving haven which allows you the freedom to exercise with other units to conduct training drills, surfaced or dived, we're trying to avoid or where necessary to promote mutual interference. Now your mobile exercise area, which at time of conflict becomes a, a weapons tight moving haven, is a box. It's an extended box normally with about um, one hour's running ahead of the central position and about two hours running uh, astern of you and a few miles either side. So this box moves along rather like a bit of organized flight plan. It's essentially underwater air traffic control. And the box may move or change shape as you gain um, a predetermined uh, exercise area, pre-allocated area. And sometimes you may find yourself even restricted in depth as two submarines may wish to cross paths and you do that by depth separation. So we have a form of underwater air traffic control. And each submarine, until it was fully worked up and had gained some operational experience, would report at regular intervals to that central control that all was well. This was known as a check report. And failure to do that would initiate the well-rehearsed and well-practiced submarine search and rescue procedures. But whether obliged to make reports or not, the central authority and indeed everyone else would always assume that a submarine is within its allocated area or moving haven. And the majority of peacetime passages from A to B were made on the surface at a transit speed of about 10 and a half to 11 and a half knots, the lower level normally in winter. And that would allow you a daily dive within your moving haven to check the trim and conduct some drills and, uh, and basic exercises. Now, the navigation equipment in the, um, in the earlier P&O class conventional submarines was, uh, was fairly basic. Um, and what you see here is, the, is the, the control room, the business end of an Alliance, HMS Alliance, an A-class wartime submarine. But the earlier P&O class, you had an Admiralty gyro compass, a magnetic compass, and a portable boats compass, known as Faithful Fred, which was secured to the top of the, the fin when all else was lost, including necessarily the ability to submerge. Now, I, I mentioned the fin there. The thing you will see on top of a submarine is not called the conning tower. That lives inside the fin. The streamlined area on the top is a fin, or if you're American, the sail. So in the control room, we remain, maintain DR and EP on an Adamfly Research Laboratory uh, table in the control room. And I'll show you that in just a minute. 
Here on the starboard side of the control I'm looking at is the Admiralty Research Laboratories table. It doubles up as a chart table. The chart outfit is underneath it. And during attacks, it works as a local operations plot with log, compass and clockwork inputs driving a little splod of light upwards through a glass surface. We had handheld sextants for use on the surface, and those were complemented by a sextant fitted within one of the periscopes. There was a Type 765 echo sounder and a basic Chernikiev log, which had to be retracted into the hull and secured by the hull valve at anything much deeper than a couple of hundred feet. After which the stopwatch, which more later, and the revolutions per knot table were in charge. For radio aids, there was one of the early versions of Decker, with all the joys of lane slip and night effect, which many of you will know. There was Consul, and there was Loran A. But very many of the radio aids navigation used in submarines at that time stemmed from those introduced for RAF Bomber Command in the 1940s. And some of those were designed to employ a 500 foot training wire aerial at altitude, whereas in a submarine we had a rather minuscule stub aerial at periscope depth at an altitude of about one foot. So that gave us an unsurprising loss of coverage and a loss of accuracy. We had radar, of course, for use surfaced or at periscope depth, but its use was positively discouraged, except for entering and leaving harbour or in congested waters in much reduced visibility, because we're stealth fighters and we don't transmit on radar. Now, the navigating officer in these conventional submarines was not a navigation specialist. Very many were, like me, supplementary list officers, initially on short service commissions with rather minimal training, two terms at Dartmouth and one term in the training squadron, then midshipman's time and testing, and then as soon as possible into the submarine service. The aim was to fill the submarine officer corps as it expanded rapidly to meet the manning requirements of the fast approaching nuclear service. And at that time in 1967, I joined submarines in 66, what an officer did in the lower levels of wardroom life, whether it be torpedo officer, navigator, sonar officer, whatever, was very much in the gift of the captain. It was also a time of instant sackings with officers found wanting left on jetties in some remote location and told effectively to <laughs> off back to the surface Navy. My second submarine was HMS Walrus. I was still a sub-lieutenant and initially I, was, I became the torpedo officer. The navigator of HMS Walrus departed. This we reckon was related to his booking us into a temperance hotel during a visit to, the, to Belfast, but that may be an apocryphal story. But that was much the measure of the time. In any case, he went, I was summoned by the captain and was told, you are now the navigating officer. Yes, sir, I said. Be in no doubt, he said, I navigate the submarine, not you. Yes, sir, I said. My captain was a remarkable man called Colin Grant. He was a large man, red-haired, bearded, and possibly the public image of a rather piratical submariner. He was an excellent tutor, and over the next 18 months, including some four months deployed to the Caribbean, taught me a remarkable amount, not merely about navigating a submarine, but about the role of every commanding officer in training and ed endlessly educating his team. He had a very robust sense of humour, essential in any submariner, and a remarkably short fuse. When surfaced and visual fixing was available from the bridge, that's a, it's a one metre square gap at the forward end of the fin. It was quite often shared with the lookout, although he had his own slightly smaller compartment just a little bit further aft. The occupants were secured by harnesses in foul weather, which was frequent. And the officer watch would take visual bearings peering through the wind, the sleet and the rain. And these would be relayed, hopefully uncorrupted through a handheld microphone, which may or may not work. Or using the voice pipe down to the control room. And then plotted on the chart in the control room by the pet officer watch staying nicely warm and dry and reporting the results, hopefully uncorrupted, up through the, the voice pipe and recommending any alterations in course. And very many places it was easier because all the information was relayed at second or third hand. 
to mark the chart as Lighthouse A, Monument B, Castle Z, rather than trying to use the names themselves, because a great deal could be lost in translation. The prudent navigating officer, and I hope I was fast becoming a prudent navigating officer, and every captain would from time to time check the chart work, check the accuracy, check the decisions from the chart table, and by taking a fix or having a good all-round look from the after periscope, check what the officer watch was actually up to. The helmsman, as often as not, would uh, whisper at the time, the captain's on the after periscope. And this would allow the young officer watch to steal himself for the inevitable blast that came up the voice pipe for some minor error or lapse in drill or oversight. Now, operating in and out of the Clyde, as we did for um, a great deal of the time, then you eventually acquired a familiarity um, and a knowledge with the topography, the geography, the lights, the boys, uh, the beacons, certain time, you could confirm that the submarine was or was not standing into danger with an all-round look. From the very beginnings of, uh, of watch keeping, what you did as an officer watch was learning to treat everything you saw, every surface contact as a target, assessing the range visually, assessing inclination, that is to say, angle on the target's bow, as well as the bearing movement, and mentally calculating and reporting to the captain the distance off track, that is the range times the sign of the angle on the target's bow. This became second nature and fosters mental agility and would be absolutely vital later in making periscope observations and conducting torpedo attacks. For ocean navigation, of course, Astro was king. And while Loran A and an extremist consul might give you a position line, DR and DP confirmed by a sounding line were the basis of most ocean navigation. Taking star sights from the rolling, heaving, soaking fin of a surface submarine in bad weather is at best tricky. You'll see from the slide in front of you at the moment that the fin is not too tall. Your height of eye is 28 feet. The submarine has no stabilizers and they can get extremely wet in foul weather. So you would use every clue available, even if that clue might be as bizarre as taking a sonar bearing of the January storms breaking on Rockall or Yan Mayan or some other place. Now common to both surface or dive navigation was the need always to generate a pool of errors. That's a circle or an ovoid expanding in a rate determined by likely log and compass errors over time and based on the last reliable fix until such time as some new information, a visual bearing, a single sounding, a sun or star line reduced it. Now the periscope sextant was usually good enough to produce a position line within a mile or two, a latitude at Merault, and so reduce the pool. But at that point, your pool of error starts to expand again until the next piece of information or fix comes along. Now the pool of errors, absolutely fundamental to, to all navigation, but particularly to submarine navigation. And it is based on a great submarine navigational truth. It is almost inevitably more important to know with certainty where you are not, rather than to know precisely where you are. Now there were some tricks of the trade how to build and refine that pool of errors, perhaps by a single sounding or a visual bearing. How a visual bearing allied to a range obtained from the almanac as a lighthouse or mountain peak or anything else of a known height above sea level dipped or rose above the horizon. And that confirmed by a single sounding would give you a very usable fix. Radar was very seldom used. How in any case it would give away just not just our position, but our identity to any surveillance satellite. Successful bottom contour navigation before the days of the, the multi-point divider, and I learned this from my captain, Colin Grant, required lengths of knotted thread or string. We eventually became quite good at this. So you would tie a knot in a piece of string at distances covering X minutes travel at a range of speeds, 
say four, six and eight knots according to the scale of the chart in use. And a single sounding every Y minutes allows you to see where the knots fit on the course being steered. And that gives you another fix or certainly allows you to start thinning down the pool of errors before it starts expanding again. A periscope depth from using Decker and its lattice charts. You had to remember to draw in dotted lines on all the, the red lattices because at night you're in red lighting and suddenly those lattices disappear. It was also quite useful as the navigator to make sure a spare chart was available for the wardroom of the officer's mess to use as a cinema screen for evening cinema. So they didn't use the chart in use. You could also find from other clues your position or something approximating to it. You could use local transits um, to, to make sure the submarine's in safe water. You could use passing ferries on fixed routes to indicate whether you might be straying to the edge of your allocated area. All are very useful means of keeping the captain content, keeping the captain in his bunk, in a fog of cigarette smoke, because everyone smoked in those days, smoking a paperback, but with an almost prescient sense of something that was about to go wrong um, in the adjacent control room. But most of all, what one developed in the submarine from an early age was periscope eye. And it's the ability during an all round look, which is a 360 degree sweep of the horizon, lasting no more than 25 seconds to recognize not only that there's this ship or that ship and noting its inclination towards you, but noticing that this headland is clear of that one, that such and such a bay is open, there's been a change in the bearing of a head mark, perhaps a lighthouse showing the tidal set is perhaps stronger than anticipated. And as much as anything, periscope eye is anticipating what should be seen. What do you expect to see and comparing that with what instantly you have actually seen? Knowing that in this position with that headland clear, you have sufficient depth of water to allow the submarine to go deep to avoid a collision or perhaps to accelerate towards a target. And this is all from a height of eye of less than one foot. It demanded a facility with mental geometry as the distance off track of any landmark just with any approaching ship can be worked out using the sign with its current relative bearing, know your sign tables, multiplied by range. And there was a pride in it. Every officer had this in working out the range of a known height of a landmark or of a ship's mast from the angles intended by the periscope spit image range finder without using tables, without resorting to the slide rule. You did this in your head and it was very good at fostering mental agility. And the submariner at periscope depth or deep always must be able to think mathematically and in three dimensions. And always the stopwatch was brought into play. And when, depending on speed and visibility, that your next all round look, normally about three or four minutes apart, was due. When at this speed, the point of danger of which you've just calculated the range will be passed and clear. When your expanding pool of errors might hit, theoretically, some known point of danger. And calculating an altering course, you have X minutes to run on this leg until the next alteration, always starting the stopwatch so that if anything else fails, you still know from your stopwatch when you can alter course. It becomes second nature to use it. So surfaced or dived in a submarine, you're navigating and the stopwatch and the pool of errors are your constant, constant companions. Now, in 1974, after the Perisher, which is the, the submarine command e examination, very aptly named, I had my first command, HMS Grampus, I haven't shown you a picture of the various submarines because candidly, the Porpoise and Oberon classes are almost indistinguishable one from another. Um, Grampus had very much the same setup as Walrus, um, same navigational setup, but it had the same need for me as a young captain to train my own officers and bring them up to speed. Within a year, I had another command, HMS Orpheus, and that's what you see here. And she was one of the modernized Oberon class, and this was a, this was a step improvement with a revised internal and rather more comfortable layout, a marginally bigger captain's cabin. It had gone from sort of 
um, understairs uh, cupboard to small downstairs loo. Um, she had a much higher battery capacity. She had greater range. She had greater endurance. And we had an improved navigational fit. We had a more modern Decker. We had Loran C. We had highly accurate EM logs, which could function at all depths to measure speed and distance run. A slightly improved radar, seldom used. A more accurate periscope sextant. Much improved echo sounders uh, to make better use of the increasing range of bottom contour charts. Um, and the ARL table, which you'll recall, designed in 1946, but still ticking away on the starboard side of the control room. But the principles of submarine navigation remain exactly the same. Use every clue, use every trick of the trade to determine whether the submarine is standing into danger without giving one's position away and being absolutely certain of where your submarine is not. That may sound counterintuitive, but it is how submarines should navigate. Because candidly, very accurate navigation, metric, submetric navigation, which we tend to sort of take for example for granted nowadays in, in, in an era of GNSS, is only really required in these circumstances for close maneuvering um, alongside. Now, during attacks, whether you're attacking a submarine or a surface target, Geographical position remains relatively unimportant as long as your submarine, again, is safe and you know where, as it were, you are not. But the entire attack problem was and is a relative one. But I've shown Orpheus here because we were the first submarine um, to be fitted with a specialist exit and re-entry chamber um, fitted above the accommodation space hatch on the forward casing. That's the forward end of the, the fin. Uh, and this was used to allow special forces frogmen to leave and enter the submarine while dived. And that meant there was uh, much call for very close inshore navigation, inevitably at night. And training in the deep and narrow Norwegian fjords at night, very few visual clues, pitch black, um, a discrete sonar ping from the main sonar, or more usually from the underwater telephone, which is a, a carrier wave at eight kilohertz, a ping off the... Uh, of the side of the fjord would give you an, an accurate distance and help to keep you safe. Now, in 1980, I was fortunate to be appointed to command HMS Spartan. Um, Swiftual class nuclear powered attack submarine. She was one year old. Um, and I described it at the time, um, making the move from conventional submarines to a nuclear powered attack submarine as rather like getting out of a Ford Sierra and into a Formula One car. And actually that was wrong. Nothing wrong with Ford Sierras, but um, it was much more like getting out of a Land Rover and into a Formula One. A Land Rover, basic, rugged, based on a wartime service and design, frequent faults, but really very easy to maintain, not necessarily comfortable, but you'll get the job done and done well. In Spartan, speed, endurance, and quietness were absolutely outstanding. And she and the other five submarines of the Swiftshaw class were on the very front line of the submarine Cold War, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Soviet Navy. And dived, she handled just like an aircraft, banking steeply into the turn on altering course, and able to change depth at absolutely astonishing angles. I have been asked, why submarines bank into the turn. You'll be aware that any surface vessel, when altering to starboard, will lean to port. And when altering to port, will lean to starboard. You'll have seen it yourselves many times. That's what happens to a submarine on the surface as well. And that is a function of the, the relative positions of the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy. When the submarine submerges and the ballast tanks are filled by water purely by venting the air out of them. The center of buoyancy and the center of gravity change place. So now your the dynamic is different. And the faster you go, the more you will bank into the turn. It is great fun. Handling this submarine at speed was absolutely exhilarating. It was great fun. 
Although it was always best to warn off the galley before you did any sort of um, pre-planned manoeuvres. But it was a submarine which could do in just about anything, anywhere in the world, you had sufficient water um, to dive. There was a brilliant sonar fit, but the navigational equipment fit was absolutely excellent with an improved suite of echo sounders, including upward looking for uh, under ice work. Loran C, which you'll see here above my left elbow. Decker, which is below my left elbow. Omega, which is behind me. Um, a seldom used radar. And from 1981, we were fortunate we had the first um, satellite navigation equipment fitted in Royal Submarine, Royal Navy submarines. Um, and this was Navstar, which was allied to a Magnavox 1105 receiver, uh, which is just out of the picture in the top. And it was fitted in the submarine by Colin Beatty, one of my predecessors as president of the Royal Institute of Navigation. Um, but the most important bit of equipment was SINS, the Submarine Inertial Navigation System Mark I. It's about half the size of a smart car. Very reliable, very accurate if properly maintained and supported, and with a slight tendency to go a little bit drifty um, once you've got north of about 83 to 85 degrees north, way up near the pole. Um, inertial navigation systems now, particularly in the era of handheld devices, do get uh, a little bit of flack in that there is um, a smaller inertial navigation sensor in your smartphone is not of the same uh, dimensions or capability as what is fitted in a nuclear powered submarine. So I am reasonably convinced that in time, uh, given the, the problems which can be experienced in resilience of satellite navigation and other sources, actually, particularly for major surface uh, vessels and submarines, then inertial navigation will become the default navigation system of the future. So extensive data handling systems for target motion analysis, which are not in this picture, also acted for us as an additional means of generating DR and DP to complement the manual pencil and paper calculations. And yes, we did both of those. And the principles of submarine navigation using and assessing every clue, always with a strong element of deep mistrust, weighing and weighting every bit of navigational evidence, stopwatch in hand, remained absolutely unchanged. This is, this is how submarines navigate. It is a question of filtering all the information you have, considering some of the information which you don't have, and which is not available to you, your, your known unknowns, and then determining what you need to do to keep the submarine safe navigationally. There you see the beautiful Spartan exiting the Gerloch um, on a remarkably calm and clear day. Now, submariners, the people in these submarines from the very beginning saw themselves as different. Um, and in time, they saw themselves as an elite other people saw them as a rather scruffy elite. Um, there was always that hint of the trade about the submarine service, but always a trade with a, a degree of arrogance to it, um, as befits an elite. In the early days, people did not wear uniform at sea, and one won whatever was comfortable. It might have been shorts and flip-flops in the Far East, uh, or layers of clothing topped by a rugby jersey, and a submarine sweater in the Atlantic winter. And it wasn't until about 1971 where uniform and the wearing of badges of rank became mandatory. Um, and that coincided with the issue of our dolphins. These are the very proudly worn mark of a qualified submariner. This came into being in 1971. Um, the people themselves, contrary to popular opinion, not all submariners are volunteers. Very many are drafted in, but certainly in my time, 
over 90% of those who were drafted into the submarine service when offered the opportunity after five years to return to the rest of the Navy, 98% opted to stay, which suggests we're probably doing something right. Submariners themselves require that very robust sense of humor, which I, I mentioned earlier. They require an unrivaled ability to get on with your fellow human being in what may be adverse circumstances. They require an absolutely tireless work ethic and an understanding family. And I've been privileged to find these qualities in abundance all around me throughout my submarine career. Submarines are an absolute mass of piping, of high powered electrics, of electronics, of propulsion systems, including nuclear steam raising plant, and of compressed air and hydraulic systems, which are the very lifeblood of any submarine. Submarines are entirely safe until you forget they can be fatally dangerous. But what submarines do in operating nuclear attack submarines and the national strategic deterrent now for over 50 years has allowed the Royal Navy as a whole, and other navies have found this too, to up its game. These are very serious, very expensive, but I think well-manned and well-trained pieces of equipment. But I hope you've seen that the principles by which they stay safe navigationally are unchanging. They are unchanged. All that is changed in today's submarines from what went before is the way in which the, nav the navigational information is presented. So where we used to use pencil and paper and analog systems, now we have digital presentations from screens, but always, however presented, however generated, the pool of errors, the need to know with certainty where you are not, and the stopwatch remain your best friends. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me, and I think we may have time for some questions.